Okay, tonight's class is going to be over common law, mostly, but I'm also going to cover uh, the law of nations, uh, Magna Carta, equity courts, and trust, and kind of like combine it all into like, so hopefully it's like really cohesive and kind of connects all the dots, like how all of these kind of combine into one. Is anyone else familiar with common law? Just the history I read. Yes. Okay. So a lot of times we're told that it's like all the statutory stuff um, in England and things like that, but that's not really true. Common law is something that's common to everyone. It's supposed to be a, a level playing field so that the common man can go into court and represent himself. It's supposed to be the law of the land, and I'm going to also cover that. Okay. So let me hit share screen and let's get started. All right. Can y'all, well, let me know when y'all can see this. Yep, it's up. Okay. So I titled this common law your best defense because in my experience, the way that common law has always worked for me is to use it defensively. And as I was reading about commercial liens, it says that once you put a commercial lien on someone, they have to refute your affidavit exactly point for point. And if you have 10 points on your affidavit and they get nine out of 10, it's still not good enough. Therefore, if they are unable to achieve that, then it will go to a common law court. And so I wanted to kind of like talk about that situation. If that ever happens to anybody, be prepared for it. Um, so I love this. I, I start with this because this is just boom, right in your face. It's literally set in stone. And I'm going to read what it says on here. And then there's some like questions on the side that I guess they're kind of somewhat rhetorical, but the answers are also right there in the stone that sometimes they can be missed the first time you go through it. Um, okay. The common law here, the common law of England was established on this continent with the arrival of the first settlers on May 13th, 1607. The first charter granted by James the first to the Virginia company in 1606 declared that the inhabitants of the colony quote unquote, shall have and enjoy all liberties, franchises and immunities as if they had been abiding and born within this our realm of England. Since Magna Carta, the common law has been the cornerstone of individual liberties, even as against the crown. Some arise later in the Bill of Rights. Its principles have inspired the development of our system of freedom under law, which is at once our dearest possession and proudest achievement presented by the Virginia State Bar, May 17th, 1959. So when I found out that this is literally set in stone and written the way that it was, I was like, my first question is, why would an attorney tell you common law doesn't exist anymore? Has anyone ever heard that before? Yes, I have. I've had um, attorneys tell me they, they almost like laughed about it. They're like common law. Um, but they can't show you a law that reads that it was ever overturned because it wasn't and it can't be. That doesn't even make sense when you find out what common law really is. So what is the difference between a resident and inhabitant? Um, you know, right here, can y'all see where my marker is? A little cursor. Yes. Okay. This declared that the inhabitants of the colony has all of these liberties, franchises and immunities. So this word inhabitant is like really, really key. And it doesn't say here a resident. So I just wanted to point that out. That's like really, really important here. And also it says, yeah, yeah, right here. Who has these liberties, franchise, and immunities? A resident or an inhabitant? 
And what does this declare the common law protects an individual from? Since Magna Carta, the common law has been the cornerstone of individual liberties, even as against the crown. So this is protecting you from the crown. And that leads me to my next page. The Law of Nations. This is a book that I got and it's so important. And if anybody, um, hold on a second. Joseph, can you turn it down just a little bit? He's listening on. Got it. Thank you. Um, this is a book that was recommended to me and I haven't even read it all the way because it's so thick. I mean, it, it's amazing though. Everything I've skimmed through is just pure genius. Um, it was written in the 1800s by Amer de Vatel. And this is what all the nations in the earth or on the earth are supposed to go by the law of nations. So if you really want to like find out what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, um, this is what they're supposed to go by. And incidentally, a lot of even judges and especially lawyers have never read this. Okay, so we got the Law of Nations. Book 1, Chapter 19, Section 213, titled Inhabitants, says, The inhabitants, as distinguished from citizens, are foreigners who are permitted to settle and stay in the country. Um, this is truly what I consider myself. I don't know about anybody else, but um, if you also go by the Bible, we are sojourners on the land and we are not here to stay. This is not our home, you know, etc. Um, book one, chapter 19, section 220, whether a person may quit his country, section two. I found this one really, really interesting because of the way that it's worded as well. As soon as the son of a citizen attains the age of manhood and acts as a citizen, he tacitly assumes that character. So, of course, like right here, the role of citizen is a character. You're acting a part. It even says it right here. They act when when you reach adulthood and act as a citizen, you tacitly assume that character, the obligations of that character. And like those of others who expressly and formally enter into engagements with society. Holly. Hello? I thought I heard some feedback or something. Um, when a society has not been formed for a determinate time, it is allowable to quit it. When that separation can take place without detriment to the society. A citizen may therefore quit the state of which he is a member, provided it be not in such a conjuncture when he cannot abandon it without doing it a visible injury. So as long as you are not harming anyone, and that word harm is very key when it comes to um, common law. Man, I actually didn't know this uh, part about Magna Carta until today, and it was just you know, mind blowing. It was, it was amazing. So we've got the Magna Carta. It was granted by King John on June 15th, 1215 under threat of civil war. This is over in England before anyone came over and colonized um, the Americas. The Magna Carta guaranteed that government royal or otherwise would be limited by the written law of the land. And that law of the land is the common law. So this is actually on the parliament.uk website and it's uh, pertaining to the clauses of Magna Carta. There's 63 of them, but only four in the Magna Carta are still valid today. So if you're taking notes, you'll want to put that part one, part 13, part 39, and part 40 are still valid today. And in uh, 39 states, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers, that's a trial by jury, and the law of the land, that's common law. And uh, clause 40 states, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny, or delay right or justice. So this is saying you can't buy your way to justice. You can't buy into your rights. 
and they cannot be denied or delayed. So that's that would be an obstruction of justice. These clauses remain law today and which were exported to America and other English speaking countries. So um, when I started studying common law, I was surprised to find out that not only is England a common law country, but so is Canada, so is America, and so is Australia. All of this common law and this Magna Carta are still valid today and would still work in every single one of those countries. Okay. This one gets me so excited too, and I've shared this picture like a million and one times. Um, it's just right there in your face, the supreme law of the land. Um, many of you probably already know this, that statutes are not law. To be convicted under a statute, you must give your consent. A statute is not a law. A code is not a law, in point of fact, in law. A concurrent or joint resolution of le legislature is not law. Statute, Black's Law, fourth edition definition. The written will of the legislature solemnly expressed according to the forms prescribed in the Constitution, an act of the legislature. U.S. Supreme Court decision, the common law is the real law, the supreme law of the land. The codes, rules, regulations, policy, and statutes are not the law. U.S. Supreme Court decision, all codes, rules, and regulations are for government authorities only, not human slash creators, in accordance with God's laws. All codes, rules, and regulations are unconstitutional and lacking due process. Y'all following me? You know it. <laughs> very, very good. I'm very proud of you. It's about to get real right here. This is right here in the Bill of Rights, Article 7 in suits at what common law where the value in controversy shall exceed twenty dollars the right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the united states than according to the rules of the common law and y'all already know how they play word games when you go into a court today, they're not gonna have the option on the little piece of paper for a trial by jury. They've switched the words around and they put jury trial. And it's not the same thing, believe it or not. That's another can of worms. So right here, we have this. We have a right to suits in common law, trial by jury. It shall be preserved. No one can hamper with that. It's obstruction of justice. And no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined. So we know that when you go to court and you get unsatisfactory uh, results, they always say, oh, you can appeal it. But look at this. If you can appeal a court case, then you did not have a suit at common law. You didn't have a real uh, trial by jury. You didn't have a real common law court. Because it says once it goes through a common law court, it can never be tried by another jury or re-examined. And here we have Article 6. This is your right to face your accuser. Mm -hmm. I love uh, it. Excuse me. <laughs> In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously <laughs> ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna show y'all an example that I've been using this one successfully to stop traffic tickets. So I think that's on the next page. Yep. Um, notices. This is really how you want to settle most of your court cases by giving notice to the court. 
I have here a template right here where you're going to put your docket number or case number. Sometimes they're not on the tickets, so you can handwrite it when you get there. I leave that spot blank. Court name as it appears online, so and so county and state, the state of Texas versus your full name. And you give them notice saying, I, first name only, a woman or a man, require the man or woman that claims I do wrong to come forward before the court and verify that this is true. And you autograph it with thumbprint touching the end of your signature in all red ink, full name printed underneath, and the date. The reason why this is actually so scary to probably a prosecuting attorney for the district is because you just have one simple, small, little sentence. That's very key because when you start rambling on and on and on and on, you're actually giving them more fuel that they can work with. They're looking for any errors in what you are uh, sending into the court. They're going to say, oh, well, you asked for $40, but you also said they need to pay your phone bill or like something like that, right? Whatever the case is. The more points you deliver, there's going to be something they can argue with. So if you only have one point, it makes it harder for them to argue it. It's very simple like that. Um, the word require is a really good one. Instead of using the word request, I recommend everybody look up the etymology for the word require and try to use that in your vocabulary more. And the word wrong here is very important, as I'll explain more later, because a wrong, there's only really two things that you could do that are wrong. And they have to be one of the one or the other. So you're requiring a man or a woman, not a title, not someone that's wearing a mask and a uniform, you know, not someone that's saying, I'm the officer or I'm playing Peter Pan in the school play or whatever. You know, you're, you don't want Peter, Plan, Peter Pan from the school play. You want the man that plays Peter Pan. So this is directly kind of like on Scooby-Doo where they take the mask off of the villain and find out who it really is. You're going after the actual person. And the other word that's important on this is verify. Anyone can verify or anyone can certify something. Uh, a lawyer can certify something for his client. That's easy. You just go to a notary and get it certified. So if you're requiring something to be certified, that's not that big of a deal. But when you put on there that you require that it's verified, well, now you're requiring that a man comes forward, says you've actually done wrong. You've actually harmed someone or something. And they have to put their hand on a Bible and swear that it's true. That's requiring of a, a lot. And so it's really not likely someone's going to do that just because you ran a stop sign or jaywalked, you know, or something simple like that. So by giving proper written notice, it puts you in honor and you want to place it upon the record. That's why you want it to be written on this piece of paper. It's recorded. They may or may not record you if you said this out loud in a courtroom. I found that out the hard way. These judges really like to play with when they go on the record and when they don't. They'll kind of uh, screw around with you because most people don't even know when they're on the record and when they're not. So you may also handwrite that you require a trial by jury and sign and date it, but my husband and I both have had success just checking that we wish for a jury trial on their own forms. Use your own discretion. We also sign the forms with under necessity, oh, that's supposed to say necessity, without recourse, all rights reserved. We sign that under our signature. Okay. Breaking the law. They like to use this one a lot. We, we hear this on the news. We see this on notices on uh, buildings these days, breaking the law. It sounds scary, but this is really the only two points that you have to consider about what the law is. Did you harm someone? Did you damage, lose, or take someone else's property? If you did not do any of these things, then what's the problem? There shouldn't be one. So basically, because it was too simple, the law was codified. And this word codified, it means they turned it all into codes. But what do we think of when we think of a code? Barcode, uh, code to get into a safe, 
or something cryptic, something that's like really mysterious and hard to decipher. And that's exactly what they did. They complicated it so much that now you have to hire a lawyer to decode it for you, to decipher all this weird legalese. Uh, when actually the law is very simple as you just saw on the last page. But there can be some benefits or actually I would, yeah, privileges to being a citizen. You get these codes, you get this codified law and sometimes it can work in your favor. Sometimes it can be a little bit more forgiving. For instance, in the penal code, um, if you committed murder, the uncodified version is you'll have a common law trial by jury and the jury decides you are guilty of murder. You're sentenced to death or life imprisonment, harm to man, loss of life. Guilty is guilty. There's no, well, maybe you didn't really mean it or this or that. It's like, you're either guilty or not guilty. There's, there's just really just one or the other. It's very black and white, but because of these codes, they've broken it down into like, well, what kind of murder? Someone killed, a uh, second degree would be someone killed out of anger and rage, but it wasn't premeditated. Or involuntary manslaughter, these are just two examples. Uh, killing from a lack of intention to cause death involving an intentional or negligent act leading to death. So a lot of times drunk drivers, when they accidentally kill someone while driving oh. drunk, they get involuntary manslaughter. Um, so if this was a common law trial it might actually be a little bit more frightening because also once the jury comes up with a decision on it, like it said in the Article 7, the Bill of Rights, it could never be reheard again. That's it. Whatever the jury comes up with, you're done. So it's very serious. And does anyone have any questions on that? I think that's pretty straightforward. Okay. That was good. How does equity tie in? This is where it gets really juicy, I think. I find this stuff interesting. Okay, so we got equity. Justice administered according to fairness as contrasted with the strictly formulated rules of common law. It was originated in England as an alternative to the harsh rules of common law. Um, one sought relief under this system in courts of equity rather than in courts of law. Equity is a body of jurisprudence or field of jurisdiction differing in its or origin, theory, and methods from the common law. Though procedurally in the federal courts and most state courts, equitable and legal rights and remedies are administered in the same court. So they've basically blurred them all in together. Not a lot of people even know that. Um, I especially, I'm just reading what I've highlighted on here, but you're welcome to like save all this information. I got it from Black's Law Dictionary 6th edition. So it was also created to render the administration of justice more complete by affording relief where the courts of law are incompetent to give it. So this is where a lot of people can find their remedy and their relief, where otherwise they're exhausting all their administrative procedures, which is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to kind of go through this order until you find your remedy. So we've got the equity jurisdiction. In the federal and most state courts, there has been a merger procedurally. They've merged them together between law and equity actions. Example, the same court has jurisdiction over both legal and equitable matters. And hence, a person seeking equitable relief brings the same complaint as in a law action and simply demands equitable relief instead of or in addition to money damages. So I like that one. You can actually get an addition of money damages with your equitable relief. What does all this have to do with trusts? The law of trust was constructed as part of equity, a body of principles made by the courts of chancery, which sought to correct the strictness of the common law. The trust was an addition to the law of property in the situation where one person held legal title to property, but the courts decided it was fair, just, or equitable that this person be compelled to use it for the benefit of another. So what this is saying is basically 
the trust section falls under equity, but it's dealing with the law of property and it's correcting the strictness of common law. So common law might actually be a little too stiff necked to handle trusts and property. And right here, this little golden nugget, I think this was taken from a book from the US Treasury's definition of a minor. Minor means an individual under the age of 18 years. The term minor is also used to refer to an individual who has attained the age of 18 years, but has not yet taken control of the securities contained in his or her minor account. So if you're following all the dots that I'm following, we need to take control of these minor accounts through the law of property, which is found in equity. And equity is where we find our remedy to correct the strictness of the common law. And we must first exhaust all of these other procedures until we find our way to this beautiful ending. So set up a private trust and get started today. Reclaim your life, energy, and property. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, that's it. You did a really great job, Catherine. I really appreciate the presentation. Once again, I was able to learn something new. I'm sure I'm not the only one, but keep up the great work. No, I, I think that was great. Uh, Kat, yeah. I did not know about the, uh, the law of nations uh, in my day about that. That's fine. Oh yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. I think I could even elaborate on that later on because there's just too much. It's almost too much. It has all these chapters. Um, the meeting's going to end in 10 minutes now, it says. So we're just going to have to wrap this up. But there's so much like chapters on sovereigns and what they can and can't do. And I'll tell you guys right now, I fell asleep on the couch the other day. And it was like going over and over and over in my head saying, I reside in a state of sovereignty. I reside in a state of sovereignty. Because your state is your state of mind, your state of being, your, you know, it's multiple things. And that just was going through my head. So whatever that means to any of y'all, you're welcome to like run with that. Yeah, you did a great job, Catherine. I agree with them. Good info. Thank you. Yes, that's an awesome, awesome job. I am wanting to get more into that that slide you had that said statutes and codes are not law. It's not law. Okay. You know, I know that we've said it, but I've never ran across uh, anything that was written that actually backed that. Oh yeah. I'll send that exact picture into the Savo group on Facebook and on uh, the Telegram, so everybody can right. save that. It's it's gold. I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. That is awesome. If anyone's reading the books in the classroom. There's also a little bit more narrative and history behind a lot of the material that Catherine just presented. If, if you want in kind of a storytelling format, it's in there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And uh, if anybody needs access to that classroom, uh, either myself or one of the directors can provide you with that access um, the resource material in Google Classroom. Um, Dominique, did you ever get access to the classroom? No, I didn't. Okay. We'll get that to you tonight. Thank you. You did great. Thank you. What book is that that's in the classroom? Book of that, the uh, whoever was referring to. Think of the, the introduction to law. Introduction, okay.
Wrap yeah. it up. I guess that's about it. But I appreciate all of y'all being here. And I hope I helped somebody. I hope at least I connected a couple of dots and kind of made things make a little bit more sense. You know, even for me doing that class, it actually got me super pumped because I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like I know all this stuff, but like sometimes I need like a refresher and a reminder and going back over it like I did today was like just what I needed. What, what gets me excited is like, this is not like us just like making stuff up. Like we're finding this in these old laws and books. I mean, not that one thing about Magna Carta was on the UK parliament website. And this is just, just, this is their information. We're not making it up, you know? Like, it's such a beautiful thing. And that's what I was hoping to accomplish. Uh, just creating a group of individuals who are tenacious, hungry and refuse to be denied. And we can figure out a way to come together and continue to collectively dig and find our own goal. Mm -hmm. So job well done. You should start working on part two for next Monday. Oh my gosh. <laughs> good night, y'all. Good night, good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. Wonderful job. Thank you, Catherine. You're awesome. Thank you.